Welcome fellow horror hounds and welcome to the latest episode of Talk and Stalk, your unholy home for horror. I'm your host Barry and today's topic of discussion is going to be on my top 5 horror icons. Now, needless to say, you know, there's a lot of horror icons out there within the horror genre. Um, you know, some characters in particular have endured uh, for decades, you know, some of these horror characters have very much become ingrained into popular culture. Uh, then there's other horror characters who just kind of come and go, you know, be it one film, two films, whatever. Um, but these are going to be my five personal favourite horror icons. And uh, needless to say, all of these horror icons are from franchises um but yeah just just to preface this as well okay uh, i don't actually consider ghostface a horror icon i'm a huge fan everyone that knows me knows i'm a huge fan of the scream franchise uh, but to me ghostface isn't actually a character it, it's merely a costume that is adopted by multiple killers over the course of the four film franchise um but i suppose with ghostface it, it's actually kind of the costume has become so iconic that it Ghostface has almost kind of become a character in its own right. But technically speaking, it's not a character. It is actually different characters just wearing a costume. I mean, don't get me wrong, the costume's cool. I love the whole Ghostface persona and all that. I love it. Um, but it's not It's not one character. Okay, so uh, to kick, the, kick things off now. Uh, in fifth place for me, uh, just to quickly say, an honourable mention would have been Chucky. Um, I do actually think that Chucky is uh, brilliantly voiced by Brad Dourif. Of course, he voiced Chucky in all of the Child's Play films up until the uh, the remake, which was voiced by Mark Hamill. Um, I do love Chucky. You know, he's got a hell of a personality and all that. Uh, obviously, certainly one of the most well-known movie killers out there. Um, never been able to take too Chucky too seriously. I don't think we're really supposed to anyway. You know, he's just like, what is he, a two-foot doll? I mean, just, just, just kick him away. Just put your foot on his head or something. Um, but anyway, I do love the character of Chucky. Um, so in fifth place for me, it's Pinhead from the Hellraiser franchise. Now, I'll admit, I'm not a massive die-hard Hellraiser fan. Uh, I really like the first film. I thought Hellbound Hellraiser 2 was a good sequel. Hellraiser, basically, the first few films I actually thought were good. And then obviously it's one of them. It very quickly became a, a, a franchise, and it just it just ended up going downhill. Um, but there's absolutely no denying that Pinhead is an iconic character. I mean, the very moment Pinhead appears, he's a character you're not going to forget. Uh, an iconic look. I love the fact of the whole the whole Cenobite thing. In fact, Chatterer is actually my favourite Cenobite, who's obviously in the first two films. Uh, but Pinhead is obviously the one that everyone's come to come to know. Um, and even though obviously Pinhead has uh, a very small role in uh, the majority of the later sequels and so forth, he's very much the mascot of that franchise. And I love that whole kind of that fine line between um, sex and death so, you know there's a very kind of you know this whole franchise really revolves around sadomasochism and uh you know pinhead's very much at kind of the forefront of that he's very much you know the uh, the token character in this franchise and uh yeah, you know, the puzzle box itself has actually become pretty iconic. It's a gateway to hell, which, again, there's a very fine line between pleasure and pain. And uh, I think mean, played by Doug Bradley in the first eight films, um, you know, one of my favourite lines is actually, we'll tear your soul apart, you know, from the original Hellraiser, which is actually what was used as the movie's tagline on the poster in the VHS box as well. Uh, Pinhead's a great looking character and uh, I just love the whole kind of ethics of the character because technically speaking even in the first movie Pinhead isn't really the villain of the movie he's simply out there to get uh, Frank who is actually the villain of the movie he's a guy that's escaped he was actually seeking out this this world of pleasure and pain if you will and he's escaped the Cenobites and Pinhead is merely there to bring him back um, but yeah, I think I think Pinhead is yeah definitely firmly in there in the fifth spot for me. Um, number four 
is Leatherface, played by Gunnar Hansen in the original. I think Leatherface, again, is certainly one of the most iconic horror movie villains out there. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a horror classic. Um, you know, it's a movie that, needless to say, caused a lot of controversy when it was released back in 74. But Leatherface is one of them characters that has been brought to the screen multiple times. Um, you know, admittedly, uh, as as the franchise went on, um, you know, I come to like the character a little less kind of each time, etc. But the original version, and I actually think, I mean, I'm probably pronouncing this wrong, Andrew Broniatsky, however you pronounce it, that played him in the 2003 remake and its subsequent prequel, actually did a really good job as Leatherface. He certainly had that towering presence, you know, the guy is six foot five. Uh, you know, Gunnar Hansen, the original, was 6'4", and, you know, what, what's scary about Leatherface to me is, you know, Leatherface is a huge hulking bloke, but he, he's one of them horror movie villains that actually runs after you with a friggin' chainsaw. I mean, if that's not traumatic, I don't know what is. This is a guy that's pretty damn quick, considering his size, and he's running after you with a chainsaw. And obviously, he's not just one character... There's a dysfunctional family that obviously plays the whole part. You've got the hitchhiker brother. You've got obviously got his father in the movie as well. But Leatherface is the one that has endured. Leatherface is... I mean, Arlie Ermey was great in the 2003 remake. Um, I thought, actually, as horror movie remakes go, I don't actually think it was a bad remake. I don't love it, but I, I certainly don't hate it at the same time. Um, but Arlie Ermey stole every scene. Uh, in that movie, I think, when he was on screen. But Leatherface is the one that has endured all this time. He's the one character that you can... You take one look at him and you know he's from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise. Um, he's... It's just... He's big. He's kind of dirty, grimy, and he's just scary. He's, he's essentially a man-child as well as core, certainly in the original. Now, I know they've give, kind of given a backstory to him in, like, the prequel... And obviously, you know, we've had like, we're getting another Leatherface film coming out pretty soon. I have no excitement left for this franchise anymore. The original is a horror classic, but there's been just so many vastly inferior sequels and reboots. And uh, But yeah, Leatherface is definitely, to me, one of the big horror characters out there. Um, certainly in the first film, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty kind of messed up. You know, this is a guy that wears a human face as, as, as his own face. You know, removes the faces. He's wielding one of the, you know, one of the scariest weapons you can imagine, a friggin' chainsaw. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, Leatherface. Uh, now number three, uh, I was very torn between these two. Actually, very torn. Um, number three is actually going to Jason Voorhees. Certainly, without a doubt, one of the most iconic, the hockey mask. Everyone knows the hockey mask. Um, you know, Camp Crystal Lake he's become synonymous with. Uh, you know, he's a character that's received a bit of a transformation like Leatherface over the years and that he's, uh, you know, to begin with, he wore a burlap sack and he was basically just a human. He was a hard-to-kill guy that was almost impossible to kill. And obviously, with Friday the 13th Part 6, Jason lives, zombie Jason was born. You know, brought back uh, to life a la, you know, a bolt of lightning, which is a, you know, a nod to Frankenstein, of course. And he became Zombie Jason, you know, he's impossible to kill, hockey mask, you know, going after the teens. Uh, you know, obviously the majority of these films are actually set, um, you know, at, at summer camps, you know, Camp Crystal Lake, etc. Uh, obviously he's been up into space and he's gone, they've done body body swapping with him and Jason goes to hell the final Friday which I really enjoy I know some people really don't like it they felt robbed because you know you only get to see Jason as Jason at the beginning of the film and near the end of the movie uh, but Jason is what can I say as as teen killers as teen slashes go he's one of the very best if not you could say arguably the best um you know, as I said, he's gone through a transformation. He used to be kind of more humanoid. He would actually run. He, he always played by a burly bloke, obviously, in um, 
Friday the 13th Part 6, he was essentially zombie Jason was born. Kane Hodder actually played him in four of the uh, Friday the 13th movies. Uh, obviously believed to have drowned in the lake, and obviously his body was never found. He saw his mother decapitated. Of course, she was the killer in the original Friday the 13th, and he's just been killing teens ever since. Um, you know, no real kind of rhyme or reason or whatever. Um, horny teens and... <laughs> Uh, yeah, Jason Voorhees, he, he's a cool looking killer and I mean, at the end of the day, you see the hockey mask, you immediately think of Jason. He, he has got, along with the next person on the list, uh, they're the two most iconic looking killers in the history of horror, I would say. So uh, yeah, Jason Voorhees, obviously he's used practically every instrument known to man. I mean, you know, the, the weapon that he tends to wield the most is actually a machete, um, but he, he's used anything and everything. Um, so yeah, now on to number two is uh, the Springwood Slasher, Freddy Krueger. Uh, again, iconic, very much become part of popular culture now. Uh, played by Robert Englund in all seven movies. Obviously, the remake by Jackie L. Healy. Who, uh, yeah, we're not really going to go into that movie. Um, but uh, Robert Englund is someone that has become a horror icon. You know, he immortalised that role of Freddy Krueger. Um, Playing that role was so... I mean, I mean, the whole thing with Nightmare on Elm Street and Freddy Krueger, it's a scary concept. It, it really is. You know, someone trying to kill you in your dreams. The dream world is his realm. Do you know what I mean? He's, he's, he's the king of that realm. And if you're killed in the dream world, you die in the real world. It's a really scary concept. Um, you know, it was kind of scary even before he became a, uh, a dream killer. You know, this is a guy that was a child murderer. And obviously, released due to a technicality, the uh, the parents of the victims and so forth, you know, they tracked him down and burned him alive, and he ended up becoming, you know, becoming, you know, Freddy Krueger, the killer that we've all know, come to, to know and love. Um, yeah, Freddy Krueger, Freddy Krueger certainly had the potential to be the top spot for me, um, but the thing is with Freddy Krueger, he, again, it's an iconic look, you know, the finger claw, you know, the finger knives on the glove, the red and green striped sweater, the hat, it, you know, he's bur horribly burned, it, it's, it's like Pinhead, it's this, he has this almost iconic, iconic look right from the get-go. Now, in the original Nightmare on Elm Street, I thought Freddy was a pretty scary character, and it was, but obviously as this quickly became a big kind of money-grabbing franchise, uh, I mean, you could clearly tell that Robert Englund was having so much of a whale of a time. He was having a hell of a time playing this character. You could tell he really relished every moment he was as Freddy Krueger. But it did get to the point where Freddy, there wasn't really anything scary about Freddy Krueger anymore. Uh, Freddy Krueger did become the star of the show, you know, churning out kind of cheesy one-liners with each kill. Admittedly, some of them are really funny, but it did get to the point where he did kind of become a Looney Tunes character of sorts, especially in the fifth and sixth movie, especially Freddy's Dead, which I hate. Um, but overall, Freddy Krueger probably has the scariest concept, the scariest premise of any horror movie villain out there. Um, so at its core, I think that Freddy Krueger is an incredibly scary character. Um, as I say, Robert Englund is very much a horror icon because of Freddy Krueger. He's gone on to star in, you know, countless other horror films since. Um, you know, so yeah, Freddy, Freddy, Freddy's right up there. You know, he's right up there as one of the, the, the best. I mean, Nightmare on Elm Street, I think, is a classic horror movie. I recently did a podcast on that. It's one of my favourite, if not my favourite, horror film of the 80s. Um, so, yeah, he, he's in the second spot. Now, number one, you've probably all worked it out. <laughs> Uh, there's one big icon that obviously, I mean, you know, there's others. Candyman obviously didn't, Candyman didn't get, get in there. As much as I like Candyman, I do love the first film. You know, I do love the first Candyman movie. But the number one spot for me always had to be Michael Myers' Halloween. Uh, the movie that, now I know Texas Chainsaw Massacre came out four years before Halloween, but it was really kind of Halloween that really kind of, Texas Chainsaw was kind of more of a proto-slasher. There's definitely slasher movie elements in there, without a doubt. 
without a doubt. Um, but the slasher genre hadn't really been fully formed at that point, and it was really with kind of Halloween that it was really starting to um, cement, you know, Halloween was the film that kind of cemented these kind of conventions within the slasher genre. Um, it's Michael Myers, the boogeyman um, in the original movie. I love the whole kind of almost supernatural aspect about him. Um, the you know he stabs his sister to death on Halloween night we don't know why he's six years old he's put inside an institute for 15 years he escapes um, and obviously uh, proceeds to head back to his hometown and stalk and kill um, obviously in the original Halloween he actually spends the majority of the film actually stalking his victims um, you know he's very much this kind of like I said, there's a supernatural kind of aspect to him. You know, he stands there, he stalks. One minute you look at him, he's there. The next minute you look back, he's gone. Uh, he obviously doesn't speak a word. Uh, you know, much like Jason, these guys don't talk. They're the strong, silent type. Um, and, yeah, with Michael Myers, it's that kind of era of mystery. Nobody quite knows what he did. Now, you had Halloween 6, uh, which is a complete convoluted mess in my opinion it's a terrible film strong contender for worst film of the franchise it gives us this always summoned by druid priests blah blah and all that i really didn't buy into that crap uh to me less is more the less you know the better um firm believer in less is more it, it's scarier when you don't know uh you know much like will Everface, they started to give a bit of a backstory to him which makes it makes it a little less scary for my liking um, but with 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 Halloween, yeah, he's very much the boogeyman. He's often referred to as the boogeyman in this film. You know, he's stalking as young Tommy Doyle, um, obviously being bullied at school. One of the uh, one of the bullies actually tells him that the boogeyman's coming to get you. And uh, you know, much like Jason, he seems to be practically impossible to kill. Um, but it is heavily implied by Dr. Sam Loomis, played by Donald Pleasance in the original film, that this isn't just a normal man. Um, that this is basically, you know, this is evil. This is evil on two legs. I mean, there's a moment where, you know, he escapes after 15 years and he gets in the car and drives away. You think, where the hell did he learn to drive? Is this a huge plot flaw? Well, the movie actually addresses it. The movie says it. The guy actually says to Dr. Sam Loomis, for God's sake, Haddonfield's so many miles away, you can't even drive. And Dr. Sam Loomis says, well, he was doing fine last night. Maybe somebody around here has been giving him lessons. So it all, this film heavily implies that Michael Myers is maybe more than just a man. Um, but I love the mask, the blank, pale, expressionless face. I think he's got one of the best masks in all of horror. Um, yeah, I, I love the fact, like, especially in the first movie, um, you know, he just has this tendency to stalk like like the stalk is just as important if not more important than the kill itself and i love that kind of whole essence of of michael myers um so yeah for me he's the original slasher and uh yeah my uh, my personal favorite you know as i say whereas jason s tends to spend a little less time stalking michael myers spends more time doing it obviously his weapon of choice is a large kitchen knife that you know he first picked up when he was six years old after you know stabbing his sister to death um you know in what's one of the in my opinion one of the best openings to to, to any horror film um yeah my, my michael myers uh, i've always known as the shape in uh, in the script um, he's very much kind of the embodiment, like Jason Voorhees, in fact, the embodiment of kind of sexual repression, if you will. You have sex, you die. These two guys are kind of the physical manifestation of that. But uh, anyway, uh, that's my that's my list. Uh, I know there's a lot of other horror characters out there. There's Pennywise, of course, there's Norman Bates. Uh, Norman Bates, I was, yeah, I was actually contemplating putting him putting him in the top five. He nearly made it because Psycho is one of my favourite horror films of all time. Um, but I just had to kind of put Pinhead in there. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyway, thanks for listening. I'll be back again soon to haunt you, torment you, and do whatever else.